All right, we're going to look there at Proverbs chapter number 23. <laughs> We're going to look at Proverbs chapter 23 and verse number uh, 21, but let's, let us turn to 1 Samuel first. We'll come back to that. That's going to be our text passage there in Proverbs chapter number 23. But turn to 1 Samuel chapter number 1 first. 1 Samuel chapter number 1. Now, when the devil tries to deceive someone, when the devil tries to deceive on an individual basis, or on a, you know, when the devil wants to deceive an entire society, he does so by slowly acclimating people to this. And you can see the devil's character even when he comes to Eve in the Garden of Eden, when he comes as the serpent, right? He comes to Eve, and the first thing that he says is, Yea, hath God said. So that's not necessarily a definitive statement. That's a very loose statement. It's a question that he's asking, right? And then Eve responds. You know, it answers that, you know, we're allowed to eat of any tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, we're not allowed to eat thereof. Let, you know, we're not allowed to touch it lest we die, she says, right? And then, you know, so first comes the question, first comes casting doubt. And then after that, he responds with, he shall not surely die. Then he goes ahead and he just moves the landmark a little bit further. So when the devil comes to deceive you, or the devil, when you look at a society, the downfall of a society, like the United States, which was once, you know, a good society, which once we had morals at some time in the past, which we no longer do. But we once had morals, you know, and we once things that were just a given, things that were just, you know, people just understood. Fornication was wrong, people knew that. Adultery was wrong, people knew that. And another big one was alcohol was wrong. Everyone knew that. The town drunk was a mockery. The town drunk even on the sitcoms in the 40s and the 50s was the buffoon. He was made fun of. But our entire society is to the point where alcohol is no big deal. Where everyone accepts alcohol. Where it's no big deal at all. Now, like I said, the devil, when he comes, he tries to change the perspective of a nation. Or he tries to ch change the perspective of an individual when he deceives someone by slowly acclimating to it. And the very first step that the devil takes is by acting like two things that are very different. Sweet and bitter, right? He tries to act like, oh, it's the same. What's sweet for bitter? Bitter for sweet. He tries to divide the lines. He tries to act like all religions are the same, right? He tries to tell you all the Bibles are the same. There's no difference between all the Bibles. He tries to first delete the line in between, right? Look at 1 Samuel chapter number 1. <coughs> Excuse me. Verse number 12. This is Hannah coming to the temple. She's praying. She wants a son. She ends up being given Samuel, of course. So this is Hannah, Samuel's mother. And Hannah's coming and she's praying. It says in verse 12, it came to pass that she continued praying before the Lord that Eli marked her mouth. Now Hannah, she spake in her heart, only her lips moved, but her voice was not heard. Therefore Eli thought she had been drunken. <coughs> verse 14. And Eli said unto her, How long wilt thou be drunken? Put away thy wine from thee. And Hannah answered and said, No, my lord, I am a woman of a sorrowful spirit. I have neither drunk wine, I have, I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but have poured out my soul before the Lord. Now I want you to see what she says in verse number 16. Count not thine handmaid for a daughter of Belial. For out of the abundance of my complaint and grief have I spoken hitherto. Now who is Belial? That's Satan. That's the devil. So Hannah comes and she's saying a prayer. And we have Eli comes up to her, and <coughs> she's saying a prayer. It says he marked her mouth, and he was watching her lips while she prayed. And she had her eyes closed, but no sound was coming out. And Eli looked at her and said, she looks like she's drunk. And you know, he, she says, no, it's because I have a sorrowful spirit. That's the reason why. And he said, and then when, she, when, when he accuses her of drinking alcohol, of being drunk, a righteous person, a righteous woman, says, don't consider me to be a son of Belial, be a child of Belial. Well, it would be a son, obviously. To be a child of Belial. He said, to Hannah, who would be a righteous person, which we need to get back to a righteous perspective on things. We need to go back, like, you know, 70, 80, 90 years in our society with our mindset, and go back to where the town drunk is still the mockery of the town. Amen. We need to go back and we understand that alcohol is not just something to play with. It's not something that's just for some people. We need to understand, we need to have the perspective of Hannah, who was a righteous woman. Right? And when someone accused her of being a drunk, she said, that's like accusing me of being the child, of being a child of the devil. Turn to, uh, I'm going to have you turn to another place. Turn to, in the same book, 1 Samuel chapter 25. 1 Samuel chapter 25. <coughs> so if there's something that's the devil's, right? And he wants to offer it to you, do you think people would drink alcohol, you know, in the past? Do you think you would be able to acclimate people to that if it was called like the devil's drink and he handed it to someone? Of course not, right? If it was called like Satan's drink, the devil's cup, and he tried to hand that to someone and get someone to drink that? Of course not. So he had to slowly over time, yeah, as God said, that's where it starts out. And he slowly over time moves that landmark to the point where he says, he shall not surely die. Where it's not going to harm you, it's not going to hurt you, it's not that bad for you, it's not my drink, right? Look at 1 Samuel chapter number 25, <coughs> look at verse number 3, just to get some context here, who we're speaking about. Now the name of the man was Nabal, this man was a man that David came to. And David sent messengers to him while David was in the field hiding from Saul out of the wilderness. This man had great abundance of substance, and David was keeping his sheep basically, watching other people when they would come by and do things, guarding them for him without being asked. David took his servants and sent them as messengers to Nabal and asked for some provisions, asked for some things that, you know, some, you know, some drinks, some food, just things that helped him, some substance. Now, when they sent him to him, you hear verse 3, notice what it says. Now, the name of the man was Nabal, and the name of his wife, <coughs> Abigail, and she was a woman of good understanding, of beautiful countenance, but the man was churlish and evil in his doings. And he was of the house of Caleb, right? So he's an evil man. Look at verse number 17 in the same chapter about this man. <coughs> now, therefore, know and consider what thou wilt do, for evil <coughs> is determined against our master and against all his household. For what? Now, watch this. For he is such a son of Belial that a man cannot speak to him. So notice that same word again that we saw in 1 Samuel, the same book, chapter number 1, the son of Belial, which is the devil. You can, you can prove that multiple ways, but a perfect example would be 2 Corinthians chapter 6. You can go there if you get time later just to see that. The word Belial means the devil. It's referring to Satan. So notice this man here is saying that he is a son of Belial. Now look again at uh, one more verse. Look at verse number 25, something I want to show you later on that happens in this chapter. Let not my Lord, I pray, this is Abigail speaking to David, <coughs> Regard this man of Belial, so we see that again, even Nabal, Nabal, for as his name is, so is he. Nabal is his name, and folly is with him. But I, thy handmaid, saw not the young man of my Lord, whom thou didst send. So again, he's called the, the son of Belial. Look at verse number 36 in the same chapter. <coughs> and Abigail came to Nabal, and behold, he held a feast in his house like the feast of a king. And Nabal's heart was merry within him. Now watch this. For he was very drunken. Wherefore she told him nothing, less or more, until the morning light. So we had in 1 Samuel chapter 1, Eli says, Hannah, put away the wine from you. How long will thou be drunken? And what's her response? She says, don't consider me a child of Belial. Don't look at me and think that I'm a child of Belial. And then she explains, I haven't been drinking. So what do you conclude from that? You know what type of people drink alcohol?
Deuteronomy chapter number 32, verse number 31. <coughs> Deuteronomy chapter number 32, verse number 31. <coughs> this is the song of Moses. It says in verse number 31, For their rock is not as our rock, even our enemies themselves being judges. For their vines are the vine of Sodom and of the fields of Gomorrah. Their grapes are grapes of gall. Their clusters are bitter. Focus on verse number 33. Their wine is the poison of dragons and the cruel venom of ass. And the title of my sermon this morning is The Poison of Dragons. The Poison of Dragons. Now, if you look at this passage, look at verse number 31. He says, For their rock is not as our rock. You get, your, you get the definition of what rock he's referring to in verse number 30. How should one chase a thousand and two put ten thousand to flight, except their rock had sold them and the Lord, <coughs> excuse me, had shut them out. So who's the rock? The Lord, right? So what's the opposite of God? What's the opposite of the Lord? It would be Satan. It would be the devil. Keep reading. Look at verse number 32 now. So he said, Their rock is not as our rock. They have a different rock, right? For their vine is of the vine of Sodom. Now, what, what, what's the implication? Before the verse before was, there's two different rocks, right? Our rock, which is God, and their rock, which is the devil, right? And then he says, for their vine is of the vine of Sodom. So the implication, or what it denotes here, what we get to know from this, is that there's two different vines as well, right? For their vine is of the vine of Sodom, and of the fields of Gomorrah. Their grapes, <coughs> excuse me, are grapes of gall. Their clusters are bitter, right? Look at verse number 33. Their wine is the poison of dragons and the cruel venom of asps. Now, over and over again, the rock in the Bible, as I said, like we can see from this passage, is likened unto Jesus Christ, right? It's likened unto him being the chief cornerstone. Jesus said in Matthew 7, you know, he pulled the parable that, he, that, any, that if a man built, if the man heard his words and did them, he would be like unto a man that built his house upon a rock. We can see Jesus Christ against the rock in Matthew 16. In the book of Psalms, over and over again, Psalm, uh, the psalmist David says, The Lord is my rock. The Lord is our rock. Over and over again, right? So Jesus Christ is our rock, right? Jesus Christ is our rock. Their rock of these people is the devil. Their rock of their rock of, 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 of these people is Satan. But look at verse chapter number 33. Just so you know I'm not taking a verse number 33, I'm sorry. Just so you know that I'm not ripping this out of context and applying my own definitions to it. Their wine is the poison of dragons. Who is the dragon in the Bible? Repeatedly. Satan. Do you think it's a coincidence that it says their, their, their wine is the poison of dragons? And then after that it says, and the cruel venom of ass. Do you know what ass is? It's a serpent. It's a snake. Do you think that's a, that's a coincidence that he says their vine is of the vine of Sodom and of the grapes and, and of the grapes of Gomorrah? He says their clusters are bitter. And then he says right after that, their wine is the poison of dragons and the cruel venom of ass. There's two different types of wine in this world, my friend. You know, and that, that's the first deception that took place. There's two different types of wine in the Bible, and there's two different types of wine in the world, whether our society has changed that definition or not. That the purpose of that is to confuse people. It's for Satan to slowly remove that landmark, and he moves, he divides that line out of the way, and then it's all just the same. Then there's only one rock. There's only one religion. Then there's only one, there's only one type of wine. There's only one type of grape. And then it's that much easier for him to come and for him to present to you the wrong kind of wine. To present to you the evil wine. To give you the bad wine. Turn back to, to Proverbs chapter number 23. Proverbs chapter number 23. So we need to get a perspective on alcohol from the Bible. We need to get... So here's the thing. You know what? A lot of Christians today would say, yeah, alcohol's bad. You know, you can drink maybe a couple drinks of it. Alcohol, alcohol is bad when you get drunk. You know, alcohol, you know, alcohol is not good. You know, I'm not going to drink. I'm not going to look down upon people that do. We need to get the Bible's perspective. Do you know what the Bible says that alcohol is? The Bible says that it's the poison of dragons. Do you know what you're like if you drink alcohol? Do you know what you're like? You're like the child of the devil. You're like, you're like a child of Satan if you drink alcohol. Amen. If you like to go out on the weekend, you know what you're acting like? You're like a child of Belial. That's what you're like. You know what? He calls it the poison of dragons. Do you know why? Because alcohol gives you woe. It says, who has woe? Who has sorrow? Who has contention? Who has battling? Who has wounds without cause? They that tarry long at the wine. They that go to seek mixed wine. You know what that is? That's the side effects of poison. That's the side effects of, of the devil's cup. That's what that is. Look at Psalms chapter number 23. And that's what I'm going to preach about this morning. The title of the sermon is the poison of dragons. The poison of dragons. And we're going to look at the side effects of alcohol. We're going to look at the side effects of poison. Look at Psalms chapter number 23. And we'll start reading. <coughs> Excuse me. We'll start reading actually further down. Uh, let's look at verse number 29. Verse number 29 says, Who hath woe? Who hath sorrow? Who hath contentions? Who hath battling? Who hath wounds without cause? Who hath redness of eyes? Now this will be our text. We're going to turn back here a couple of times. I want you to look at these passages. Go to Isaiah chapter number 28, verse number 1. I want you to see the consistency over and over and over again. <coughs> so it says, the type of the person that drinks the poison of dragons, it says, Who hath woe? That's the first part. Who hath woe? So Isaiah chapter number 28, verse number 1. Look at verse number 1. <coughs> woe. You know what woe is? Woe is a curse. Woe to the crown of pride. Watch this. To the drunkards of Ephraim, whose, glory, whose glorious beauty is a fading flower, which, on, which are on the head of the fat valleys of them that are overcome with wine. Go to Isaiah chapter number 5, verse number 11. <laughs> Isaiah chapter number 5, verse number 11. <coughs> he says, Woe unto them that rise up early in the morning, that they may follow strong drink, that continue until night, till wine inflame them. Look at verse number 22 in the same passage. Actually, let's start reading verse number 20, because I quoted this earlier, and this isn't a coincidence. There are no coincidences in the Bible. Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil, that put darkness for light and light for darkness, that put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Notice before what it said. What's the opposite? There's two different types of wine, and one is bitter. What, what would you conclude that the other type is? If there's two contrasts, if one's bitter, what would make sense that the other one is? Sweet, right? Like what? Like grape juice, maybe. Maybe like the exact opposite of alcohol. Yeah. <laughs> so it says, Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil, that put darkness for light and light for darkness, that put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Woe unto them that are wise in their own eyes and prudent in their own sight. You know why I said that? Because drunkards are always prideful, because they're full of pride. Like the Bible says, only by pride comes contention. And what's one of the side effects of alcohol? Contentions, right? That's why it says right here, Woe unto them, and watch in verse number 22. Woe unto them that are mighty to drink wine. Why does he say mighty? Are you a tough guy because you drink wine? No, you think you're a tough guy. Because what you really look like is a total idiot. Amen. So he says, Woe unto them that are mighty to drink wine, and men of strength to mingle <coughs> strong drink. Go to Isaiah, Isaiah chapter number 51. Same book here. This is just one book. 
Isaiah chapter number 51. One of the side effects of alcohol, one of the side effects of drinking the poison of dragons, of drinking poison, is a curse will be upon you. You know whose curse it is? Really? It's God's curse. Especially if you're a saved person. Especially if you're a Christian. And you decide, hey, I'm going to start drinking alcohol. I'm going to start going out with, with my friends on the weekends. You know what's going to happen in your life? You're going to have woe in your life. You're going to have curses in your life. God's going to punish you. You're not going to have fun. You may think you're going to have fun. You're not going to have fun. Look at Isaiah chapter 51. Look at verse number 17. <clears throat> Awake, awake, stand up, O Jerusalem, which has drunk at the hand of the Lord the cup of his fury. So who's the one doing this? God's the one doing this. Thou hast drunk in the dregs of the cup of trembling and wrung them out. Now use that verse because now we're going to go to Revelation chapter 14. <clears throat> now he didn't use the word woe there, but woe is just a curse, right? <clears throat> and we can see that God's punishment or God's curse, God's wrath of being poured out his fury is like in that passage that we had just read unto a cup of alcohol. Look at Revelation chapter number 14. <clears throat> Revelation chapter number 14. Verse number 7. <clears throat> the Bible says, Sing with a loud voice, fear God, and give glory to him. For the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. And there followed another angel, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And the third angel followed, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast in his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, look at verse 10 again, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the, in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. So notice right here, what is God's, what is God's punishment? What is God's wrath wrapped up with? He wraps it up with a cup of alcohol. He wraps it up with a cup of wine. Now, if you look over, <coughs> and Revelation, excuse me, I'll read it to you in Revelation chapter 8, verse number 13. It says, I beheld, and I heard an angel flying through the midst of heaven, saying with a loud voice. This is a parallel passage. Whoa, whoa, whoa to the inhabitants of the earth by reason of the other voices of the trumpet of the three angels, which are yet to sound. One chapter after, one chapter after that, Revelation 19, 12. One woe is passed, and behold, there come two, two woes more hereafter. Revelation 11, 14. The second woe is passed, and behold, the third woe cometh quickly. Turn it back in chapter 2, verse 15. <laughs> back in chapter 2, verse 15. <laughs> So over and over again, God's wrath there, the woes, the curses that God is putting upon the, the wicked or the evil people, God says, that's like my, that's like my cup of wine that I'm going to pour out on you. That's like my cup of wrath that I'm going to pour out on you. Over and over again, we see woes tied with alcohol. A woe is a curse. Look at the back in chapter number 2. Look at verse number 15. <coughs> it says, Woe unto him that giveth his neighbor drink, that puts thy bottle to him, and make it, and make it, make his him drunken also, that thou mayest look on their nakedness. So notice again another verse. Over and over again, we're talking about drunkenness. We're talking about, about being drunk, getting drunk. What's the word that we keep saying come up? Whoa. Keep saying, whoa. You know why? Because if you drink alcohol, if you drink the poison of dragons, if you drink the devil's cup, if you drink you know, the, the vines of Sodom and the vines of Gomorrah, you have a curse upon you. You'll have you'll have woe upon your life. Turn to Isaiah chapter 19, verse number 14. Isaiah chapter 19, verse number 14. I'm gonna finish reading you from this chapter, which says in, in, in verse 16. Thou art filled with shame for glory. Drink thou also, and let thy foreskin be uncovered. The cup of the Lord's right hand shall be turned unto thee, and shameful spewing shall be on thy glory. Notice that word spewing, right? We're going to see that come up over and over again here, too. I'll read some of these to you, and then you can turn to a couple other ones. Isaiah chapter 19, verse 14, where you're at now. The Lord hath mingled a perverse. I want you to pay attention to that word, too. That's going to come up again in a second. Perverse spirit in the midst thereof, and they have caused Egypt to err in every work thereof. As a drunken man, now watch this, staggereth in his vomit. Just like it said right here, and shameful spewing shall be on thy glory. You can turn to Isaiah chapter 28, verse 8. That's pretty close for you. I'll read to you from Jeremiah chapter 48, verse 26. <clears throat> Make ye him drunken, for he magnified himself against the Lord. Moab also shall wallow in his vomit, and he also shall be in derision. So notice, he shall wallow in his vomit. The Bible does not paint a good picture of alcohol. The Bible does not make you look like a cool guy when you drink alcohol. You know what you look like? You look like a stinking loser. That's what you look like. And that's actually what you look like to any sane person. If I were walking to a bar, and I would see a bunch of idiots walking around, just speaking nonsense, making a fool of themselves, you know what I would think in my mind? I would think, you look like a total idiot. You look like a complete and absolute moron. Look at, look at, uh, go back to, right, have you turned? Isaiah chapter 28, verse 8, look at this. <coughs> For all tables are full of vomit and filthiness, so that there is no place clean. Notice that, over and over and over again. Does that sound like a fun time to you? You know what the devil first did? The devil first tried to act like, oh, there's no difference. He put sweet for better, better for sweet. Now he tries to tell the kids, now he tries to tell all the people in high school and all the college kids, you're going to have a good time. You're going to have fun. You know what you're really going to do? You're going to wallow in your own vomit. You're going to lay in your own filthiness. That's what you're going to do. You're going you're to wallow in your own vomit. You're going to walk into a bar and there'll be no place clean. You know why? Because all the tables are filled with vomit. All the tables are filled with filthiness. That's what it's really like. This is a real perspective of alcohol. Right? And you know what another real perspective of alcohol is? If you drink alcohol, you're like the son of the devil. That's what you're like. You know what you're drinking? You're drinking the poison of dragons. You're drinking the cup of the devil. It's not just some other drink that's just bad. No. It's so bad that it's the devil's drink. That's what you're doing. You're drinking the cup of the devil. Look at the back in 215. Go back to back in 215. <coughs> so we see all the woes, right? All the curses. You're going you're to throw up. You're going to puke. If you drink alcohol, you're going to wake up in the morning, you're not going to feel good. What was the opposite of being happy, right? What was the opposite of being blessed? Oh, what was a curse? Yep. That's what happens when you drink poison. That's a side effect of drinking poison. <clears throat> Look at back in 215. This is another, this is another curse. Now notice who the, who the woe is given to. Woe unto him that giveth his neighbor drink. So notice that the woe here is given to the person that's giving his neighbor drink. But you know what happens, I'm going to show you this here in a minute, is over and over again, people that maybe are saved people, people that are maybe Christian people, they bring themselves under the curse of another person by affiliating themselves with people that are drinking the cup of the devil. By affiliating themselves or associating themselves with alcohol in places where people drink alcohol. You go to these places and you know what happens? The curse that's upon these other people, God obviously punishes you because you're saved, but that curse comes upon you. I'm going to show you that here in just a minute, but notice, notice what's going on here. Woe unto him, that's a male pronoun, that's a masculine pronoun, that giveth his neighbor, that's a masculine pronoun, neighbor drink, that puts thy bottle to him. Him and make his him drunken also, that thou mayest look on their nakedness. This is a man 
that's getting another man drunk so that he can look at his nakedness. That's about the worst possible thing that could happen to you. And here's the thing, I don't care if you say, man, I just love to drink. I just love getting drunk. I just love, you know, places that are filled with vomit and wallowing in my own vomit. Okay, you're an idiot, number one. But I don't give a crap how much fun getting drunk is, or how much fun you think it is. I would never take the chance of getting drunk so that something like this would happen to me. There's no other worse curse or no other worse woe that could come upon you than getting drunk, passing out, or getting drunk to the point where you just have no idea what you're doing, and then some guy molesting you, someone of the same sex molesting you. I mean, it's bad being molested anyways, but like, you don't have to get much worse than this. Amen. I want you to turn, I want you to turn to another passage where we can see this again. Go to uh, Genesis chapter 19, verse 30. Notice earlier, like I read, it said in Isaiah 19, 14, the Lord hath mingled a perverse spirit in the midst thereof. Notice that word perverse right here. We see somebody being a pervert, right? We see somebody, it says in verse 16, the very next verse, it says, let thy foreskin be uncovered. Talk about yeah, one person getting another person naked. What would you call that person? I would say they're a pervert, right? There it said, of the pretty mingled a perverse spirit, right? When you look over to Proverbs chapter 23, what we read before, he tells them, thine eyes shall behold strange women. And actually, when you look at that chapter, <clears throat> you see that statement, thine eyes shall behold strange women, right before he goes into the warnings of drinking alcohol, you know what he says to him? He's giving him warnings about the whore. You know that? He's giving him warnings about, about the, the, the strange woman. And then he goes into alcohol, and then he says, thine eyes shall behold strange women. He's making a connection. If you want to avoid the strange woman, and not only the strange woman as we saw in the back of chapter two, if you want to avoid someone seducing you, someone molesting you, you know what you need to do? You need to stay as far away from alcohol as you can. Yeah. Stay as far away from poison as you can. <clears throat> so that's another connection we see with, with someone being a pervert, getting drunk and being a pervert. Look at Genesis chapter number 19. <clears throat> Genesis chapter number 19. <clears throat> Look at verse number 30. <clears throat> Genesis chapter number 19. <clears throat> verse number 30 is after Lot and his two daughters escaped from Sodom and Gomorrah. And Lot went about Zor and dwelt in the mountain and his two daughters with him, for he dwelt in, he feared to dwell in Zor. And he dwelt in a cave, he and his two daughters. And the first one said to the younger, Our father is older, there's not a man in the earth to come in us after the manner of all the earth. Come, let us make our father drink wine, <clears throat> and we will lie with him. That we may preserve seed of our father. And they made their father drink wine that night. The firstborn went in and lay with her, lay with her father. And he perceived not when she lay down, nor when she arose. And it came to pass on the morrow that the firstborn said to the younger, Behold, I lay yesterday night with my father. Let us make him drink wine this night also. And go thou in and lie with him, that we may preserve seed of our father. And they made their father drink wine that night also. And the younger arose and lay with him. And he perceived not when she lay down, nor when she arose. Thus were both the daughters of Lot with child by their father. Now, what I want to point out about this, number one, is we see sexual perversion again with alcohol. Number one. But I want you to get into the minds of the two daughters a lot. Now, they, obviously, they picked up a lot of wicked stuff. Now, it's not a coincidence it's in chapter 19, and they just left Sodom. That's what happens when you, you raise your kids in Sodom and Gomorrah. That's what happens when you raise your kids in the public school system, by the way. That kind of filth gets into their minds. This kind of corruption and, and just, just disgusting stuff, right? But I want you to get into their minds, right? They, they're idiots, and they think, well, there's nobody else on the entire earth, and we need to you know, preserve seed of our father, which is disgusting, right? Yep. But this is the point I want, I want to make, I want to make about this. Mm -hmm. Get into their minds in this, in this sense. They're thinking, how can I get my father to do this? What method or what tool can I use to get from point A to point B? Did they succeed? Mm -hmm. They did. And you know what they used? Alcohol. Do you know what Jeffrey Dahmer did to like over a hundred people? Yep. Do you know Jeffrey? Do you know who Jeffrey Dahmer is? He was a mass serial killer, and he was a sodomite. Not a coincidence if you read Romans chapter one. <clears throat> the guy was a sodomite, and he was a serial killer. And do you know his method? You know what he did? He went to bars, and he got people drunk, and he gate raped them. Kind of like the back in chapter two, verse fifteen. Kind of like the two daughters of Lot here. They're like, hey, I want to get my father. I want to get my father to do something. If you want someone to molest you, then go drink alcohol. If you want woe in your life, if you want curses in your life, if you want horrible perverted things that will scar you for the rest of your life to happen to you. <coughs> then go to the bar down the street this next weekend. Because that's what will happen. <coughs> Turn to Genesis 9 and we'll see again. <coughs> Genesis 9. <coughs> look at Genesis 9 and we'll look at verse number 20. This is after Noah gets off the ark. And Noah began to be a husbandman, and he planted a vineyard, and he drank of the wine, and was drunken. <coughs> And he was uncovered within his tent. Kind of like in back in 2.16 when it said, uncover your foreskin, right? We keep saying this stuff, I'm going to go over again. It gets far worse than that. Drunkard, if you think that's as bad as it's going to get, that you're going to get naked and run the street like frat boy, it gets far worse than that. Look at verse 22. And Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father, and told his two brethren without, and Shem and Jacob took a garment, <coughs> and laid it upon, their, upon both their shoulders, and went backward and covered the nakedness of their father. And their faces were backward, and they saw not their father's nakedness. Watch this. And Noah woke from his wine and knew his younger son had done unto him. Watch this. And he said, Curse it be Canaan. What's a curse? It's a woe, right? You know what happens when you drink alcohol? There's a couple of things that are always associated with it. Woes, curses, sexual perversion. If you were to go to all these college kids and say, hey, after they graduated for about five years, you say, hey, what's the, what's the biggest mistake you've ever made in your life? You know when those mistakes happen? When these guys were getting, were getting drunk on the weekend. That's when. That's when these kind of mistakes happen. You know when people make the worst decisions of their entire lives? It's when they get drunk. It's when they drink poison, when they drink the poison of dragons, right? Mm -hmm. Have you turned back? Go back to uh, First Angel chapter number one. Mm -hmm. First Angel chapter number one. They think, oh, I'm just going to get drunk. You know, I'm just going to get drunk. I'm going to have a good time. You know, I'm just, you know, I'm just sad. I'm just going to get drunk and have a good time. What did the Bible say about the person that gets drunk? <coughs> Here's the thing, fool. You do not get drunk and have a good time. You do not get drunk and it makes you happy. You know what it makes you? It makes you more sad. Yeah. You know, I, I unfortunately have had experience with this. There's been places where people get drunk and stuff. You know, and made a lot of mistakes myself. And you know what a lot of people did when they got drunk? They cried. So if you think, oh, you know, I'm going to get drunk. It's going to make me happy. It's going to make me happy. Is the bum down the street happy? Because he drinks more than anybody. If it's going to make you happy, it should make him more happy than anybody, right? Yeah. <coughs> he's the most miserable person upon this planet. You know why? Because he's a drunken, stinking loser that does nothing with his life. And that's exactly what you'll be like if you go out there and you start drinking too. And everybody starts somewhere. You think, oh, I'm just going to drink and end up being the, the retard on the street that's begging for money just so they get, you know, 15 bucks to go buy some alcohol. Because you're a stinking loser if you drink. And that's what you turn into. It's a loser and a bum on the street. And it doesn't make you happy. It makes you, makes you sorrowful. What did it say? Who has woe? Who has sorrow? It doesn't make you happy. It mak
You're gonna have woe in your life. You wanna know another side effect of poison? Another side effect of alcohol? Right here, you're gonna be sorrowful. You say, oh, I don't to drink alcohol and make me feel bad. No, you're not. You're gonna be miserable like the, like the bum in the street. Yep. You're gonna be sad. You're gonna be sorrowful for the rest of your life. You say, I just like to drink. I'm never gonna stop drinking. I'm gonna drink the rest of my life. You're gonna be sad and sorrowful for the rest of your life. You're gonna be a loser for the rest of your life. That's what'll happen to you. Woe and sorrow. We'll see this again. Turn to Ezekiel chapter 23, verse number 33. <clears throat> over and over again. This isn't just a coincidence that woe and drunkenness keeps coming up together. <clears throat> Ezekiel chapter number 23, verse number 33. Ezekiel chapter 23, verse number 33. <clears throat> we saw woe and drunkenness. Now we're going to see sorrow and drunkenness. Ezekiel chapter number 23, verse number 33. Thou shalt be filled with drunkenness and sorrow, with the cup of astonishment and desolation, with the cup of thy sister Samaria. So notice, you're not only going to be filled with drunkenness if you want to go out and you want to drink alcohol, you're going to be filled with drunkenness and sorrow. <clears throat> Look at another passage. Turn to uh, Jeremiah chapter 23, verse number 9. <clears throat> just a couple of, just one book back. Isaiah chapter number 23, verse number 9. I'm oh, sorry, Jeremiah chapter 23, verse number 9. <clears throat> I'm not wrong. Jeremiah chapter 23, verse number 9. <clears throat> in Jeremiah chapter 23, verse number 9. My heart within me is broken because of the prophets. All my bones shake. I am like a drunken man and like a man whom wine hath overcome because of the Lord and because of the words of his holy. So notice what he said at the beginning. <coughs> my heart within me is broken. What is somebody say? What are they saying when someone says, I have, my heart is broken. You broke my heart. Is that person happy? They're sad. They're sorrowful, right? And he says, because of the prophets, all my bones shake. And he says, I am like a drunken man. You know what you're going to be when, you, when you're drunk? You're not going to be happy. You're going to be sorrowful. <coughs> Look at one more passage. Joel chapter 1, verse number 5. Joel chapter 1, verse number 5. <coughs> Joel chapter 1, verse number 5. It says, <coughs> in Joel chapter 1, verse 5, Awake, ye drunkards, and weep, and howl, all ye drinkers of wine, because of the new wine, for it is cut off from your mouth. Weeping is like crying. That's what the, that's what the word weeping in the Bible means. When the Bible says cry, it means to yell. When the Bible says weep, it means to cry. So over and over again, the drunkards are sorrowful. You're going to feel the drunkenness and sorrow, right? Over and over again, we see, who has woe, who has sorrow? We turn here, what's it tell us? Awake, ye drunkards, and what else are you going to do when you drink alcohol? You're going to weep. It's not going to make you happy. It's not going to fix your life. It's going to bring woe and curses and sorrow and bad health. That's the type of thing. Those are the side effects of poison. If you want to drink the poison of dragons, if you want to consume alcohol in your life, that's what your life is going to be like. You're saying, this is what you're saying. I want woe, I want sorrow, I want contentious, I want battling. These are the things that it's a full package. You don't get to say, well, I just want, I just want to drink alcohol. I just want my friends. It doesn't work like that. There are side effects with poison. And that's what happens when you drink alcohol. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14. <clears throat> 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14. <clears throat> <clears throat> Us as Christians, we're to live a separated life. You know, if you if you drink the cup of the devil, if you drink the poison of dragons, and you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you're still going to go to heaven. You know, you're still going to have woe, and you're still going to have sorrow. Yep. But you're supposed to live your life differently. There's supposed to be a separation or a division between you. You should be, you know, you're on the rock, right? Well, you should be also drinking the pure blood of the grape. I had to show you this, but like two chapters before, actually the chapter before that, Moses says to the children of Israel, he says that thou hast drank the pure blood of the grape. So it's not that they weren't drinking wine, because wine is juice. Mm -hmm. It's that they were drinking the pure blood of the grape, and they weren't drinking the poison of dragons. They were drinking, you know, the pure, pure grape juice, Jesus' cup, right? God's wine, fresh juice, healthy juice, something that's good for you, and doesn't bring woe sorrow, and they weren't drinking of the vine of Sodom. Gomorrah, right? Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 6, <clears throat> verse number 14. He tells you, be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness, and what communion hath light with darkness? And then says this, and what concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple, uh, ye are the temple of the living God. <clears throat> this whole passage, you know what it's saying? You're a child of God. So don't go and, and be with people who aren't a child of God. Don't yoke yourself up with other people who aren't saved. <clears throat> what do you have in common with a son of the devil? That's what he's saying. Why would you even be around a person like that? Look at one more passage here. One here concludes in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse, verse 20. <clears throat> This whole, that whole passage is about separation, right? The Bible repeatedly talks about because we're children of life, that we should walk in life. We should walk worthy of the vocation by which we are called. We should live our lives differently. Yeah, you're saved. You're going to heaven. But that doesn't mean oh, I can just do whatever I want. Obviously, you know, you're going to have God's punishment upon you. But just automatically, if you're going to drink poison, you're going to have woe and sorrow upon your life. But we shouldn't only do it because we're afraid of the side effects of poison, the poison of dragons. We should do it because we love God. Jesus okay. said, if you love me, keep my commands. You know why you shouldn't drink the cup of the devils? The cup of Satan? The, the alcohol? You know why? Because you love Jesus. Okay. Because you love your rock. Because you love you know, the pure blood of the grape. That's why. That's the reason why. Look at uh, 1 Corinthians chapter number 10. Look at verse number 20. But I say that the things with the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to devils and not to God. Now watch this. And I would not <coughs> that you should have fellowship with devils. I was talking about fellowship in 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Verse 21. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. You cannot be partakers of the Lord's table and of the table of devils. Notice the contrast again. He has the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. The cup of the Lord, the type of, grape, the type of, uh, of wine that Jesus Christ drank at the Last Supper was not the poison of dragons. It was not the love of the vine of Sodom and Gomorrah. It was not, you know, the, the venom of ass. That's not what it was. And us as Christians, we should do right, not only because we're afraid of side effects. I mean, that shouldn't you. I don't want to walk in my life. I don't want sorrow. I don't want to be sexually molested. That's a pretty big motivator, I think. Right? But even besides that, because you love Jesus, you should want to drink of his cup. Because you love Jesus, you should not want to partake with devils. You should not want to partake with wickedness. You should not want to partake of the poison of dragons. Because you love Jesus. That's why. Not only because of the side effects, but because you love God. That's why. Let's bow our heads word for it. Heavenly Father God, we thank you for this morning, dear Lord. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the warnings in your word and the admonitions about all the side effects and the horrible things that can happen to us. We drink alcohol. Help us to take heed, dear Lord God. Help us not be offended about the you know the strong words that are in, in the Bible, dear Lord God. But just to understand that they're there for our benefit and we can learn from them. Help us just to uh, help us just to live our lives that would be pleasing to you and to do things that would be pleasing to you and uh, to show and express our love to you. We love you and be with us in Jesus Christ's name. Amen.